Okay, well most of you haven't moved anyway, so we might as well get going, right? Okay, I'm committed to get you out of here at 9, so let me, let me move forward with talking about Bridgeway's mission. And then we'll talk about the biblical basis for that as well as we go through that. Bridgeway's mission is building into one another as we build bridges to our community. So we believe that that's why we exist. Mission answers the question, why do you exist? Vision answers the question, where are you going? So as we talk about mission, why do we exist? We exist to build into one another as we build bridges to the community. The firing order there, you'll, you'll hear two specific objectives there, building into one another and then building bridges to the com community. The firing order there is significant. And here's why. When Jesus prayed his longest prayer that's recorded in the scriptures in John chapter 17, he first prayed for his disciples and then he prayed for those who would believe the message of his disciples. Do you know who's in that people group? We are. We're in that people group. If you were to look at that prayer, the many verses of that prayer, and try to summarize it in one word, I think you would come up with this word. Jesus is praying for unity. Unity. And listen to one of the things Jesus prayed. I'll give a, a sort of my own translation. It, it'll be supported by whatever translation that you, that you read. Jesus prayed that we would be in complete unity so that the world would know that God loved them and sent his son. Now, I want you to think about that. Jesus prayed that we would be so unified that the watching world would look and it would validate our message that God loves them, the world, and sent his son. So here's, what I, here's the conclusion I make based on that. How we get along with one another, how we treat one another, the unity that we live out as a church has evangelistic implications. In other words, if we are not getting along with one another, if we don't take care of one another, then what do we have to offer a watching world? They can get that at work. <laughs> they can get that in their neighborhood. They can get that under their own roof. They're looking for a place where people get along, where people love one another. And if we do love one another, then the world We'll, we, we will validate the message that we have. You've heard it said before, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. In some ways, they want to know that we care for each other. That if they're going to become a member of the family, that they're going to be well cared for. So, the first half of the mission is building into one another. Do you know that that phrase, one another, appears over 50 times in the New Testament when it's accompanied by an imperative? You know what an imperative is? An imperative is a verb that calls for action. So, it's so you can sort of think of it as a command. So over 50 times in the New Testament alone, we're commanded to do something with one another. Now we know that love leads the band. We know that the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins with love. I sort of think of love as being the umbrella over all the other fruit. The joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness. They're all sort of ways to manifest love relationally. So I think love becomes the very significant one another. But there are others. Well, there's over 50 others. And they generally fall into 10 to 12 different categories. And without thinking too much, I think... You folks look very smart, very biblically literate. I bet we can come up with, what do you think, six of them? You think we can come up with six biblical one another's? <coughs> I just gave you the first one. What is it? Love one another. What else does the Bible say when it accompanies one another with something we're supposed to do? Be kind to one another. Pray for one another. Forgive one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. 
Boy, we're halfway there. Uh oh, hump day. <laughs> there are some others. Esteem, I love that one. Esteem one another higher than them, themselves, which in some translations is honor one another or accept one another. Yeah. Well, in share, greet one another is in there. This idea of greeting, greeting one another. Paul oftentimes used that. Serve one another is certainly there. Have you ever heard, what's that? Confess your sins to one another. Confess your sins one to another. Very good. In James chapter 5, and pray for one another that you may be healed. So confess and pray are both one another's that we see in James. So clearly we're climbing, climbing the ladder here. Bear with one another. And how about bear one another's burdens? So bear with is sort of showing tolerance of one another, to sort of accept one another, like esteem one another. And then um, to bear one another's burdens is to kind of share burdens, encourage one another, walk arm in arm with, another's, with, with others. So think about what the church would look like if we were doing that in all of our relationships within the, within the body. Oh, it would be a very special place. And it would really validate the message that God can make a difference in your life because it's transformed us. Look how we treat one another. So part of our mission is building into one another so that we can build bridges to the community because we're not just called to be a holy huddle, right? We're not just called to sort of keep this, this stuff to ourselves. We're also called to be salt and light. We're also called to reach out. We're also called to be witnesses and invite others in. So that's that building bridges into, into the community as well. So how's that done practically here at Bridgeway? When you think about mission, of ways that we build into one another, we do this in a variety of ways. We do this by serving one another through a variety of ministries. We do this in small groups. We do this in accountability relationships. We do this um, uh, even through the preached word we're building into one another. How do we build bridges into the community? Will we do this by having a radio show that's out there on the airways? We do this by, by feeding a thousand people in our food cupboard every month. We do this by having a ministry down on Wilkins Avenue in Baltimore called Five Loaves and Two Fishes where we have a, a life group on Wednesday nights down there and on Sundays we minister to the heroin addicts and the prostitutes down there on Wilkins. That's building bridges into the community. We do it by making our facility available to the community so that the, when the police academy has their graduation they have it in our theater and when uh, when other youth organizations want to use a great facility like we have over at Nexus, we make that available to them. So those are trying to build bridges into the, into the community. So those are some of the practical ways that we're trying to accomplish this mission of building into one another as we build bridges to our community. So I want to move to vision next. Bridgeway's vision. So this is a destination. So we're here, but we want to get over there. So we got to have a target. We got to know what we're shooting for. We're shooting for this. And then we've got to know how we're going to get from here to there. So what are the vehicles that are going to get us there? So those, those might, you might think of those as the programs or the initiatives that are going to get us there. And then, and then also the drivers in those vehicles are sort of the leadership and the core values that are going to sustain our efforts in getting there. But we've got to think about where we're going first. This is what we're trying to be. We're trying to be a multicultural body. Let me ask you, do you think that's easy? It's not easy. It's not easy to continue to be a multicultural body. Why? We have an African-American senior pastor and we have an African-American worship director. Do you know how easy it would be to tip the scales here? To tip the scales just methodologically or leadership wise to all of a sudden we no longer have 52 different cultures represented but now, we're, now we've become more monocultural. So it's, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of leadership strategizing to be a multicultural body of fully devoted followers of Christ. Well, that takes a lot of effort too, but that's where we want to get. We want to have that as a destination. Where do we want to go? We want to go to a place where we're multicultural and we have mature believers there. Why do we want to be multicultural? Well, 
Let me talk about the day the church was birthed, and I want to talk about the day when the church all comes together in heaven. Okay? The day the church was birthed, which you already answered, right, is in Acts chapter 2. If you count the different people groups in Acts chapter 2 that were hearing the message in their own language. So what do you know right there? You know that they were multilingual, right? There were, there were different languages. So they were clearly from different cultures. And as you read through that, of what was going on there at Pentecost, do you know that Pentecost was a Jewish holiday before the church was born? Pentecost comes 50 days after Passover. So Passover is celebrated. Now think about the Jewish calendar, not the Christian calendar. So on Passover, that's a celebration of what? The 10 plagues in Egypt, right? On the last one being the Passover. 50 days after the Passover, the, the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel had left Egypt and found themselves at Mount Sinai, and there they received what? The Ten Commandments. They received the law. So that became a feast as well called Pentecost. And so it was on Pentecost that people had come to Jerusalem to worship God. Fifteen different people groups that you can count there. Then when you go into Revelation 7, Revelation 5, and you see people from every tongue, tribe, and nation singing praises. So the church started on day one being what? Multicultural. It's going to end in heaven being what? Multicultural. Why would we change anything between Alpha and Omega? The beginning and the end. Why would we try to change anything? I think the church best reflects what it's supposed to be when we're working this stuff through in a multicultural context. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be mature believers, a multicultural family, moving forward in unity, key prayer of Jesus in John 17, and love, greatest command, right? The greatest command when Jesus was cornered by a lawyer and John in uh, Matthew chapter 22 and was asked, what's the greatest command? Jesus didn't hesitate. He said what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. If you take your Bible and you separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. Well, I can't do it because mine, mine's electronic. <laughs> but if you separate, if you put your thumb between Malachi and Matthew and hold it up, you're going to see almost 80% of your scripture is in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, hey, let me summarize those 39 books for you. Let me summarize them in one word. The word is love. A lot of people, when they read the Old Testament, they don't get that. But when you ask the expert, the one who wrote it, by the way, Jesus, God, it's the word of God, he summarized it in love. Really, the one commandment is love, love others as an outgrowth of your love for God. That would be the one, one, one command. Jesus says, love God, vertical, love your neighbor horizontal. So it's all about love. So that's the reason for this in, the, in our destination, to reach our community, our culture, and our world for Jesus Christ. Again, we're here intentionally with a purpose to reach the world. So remember Holy Spirit came down in Acts chapter 2? Who went up in Acts chapter 1? Jesus did. One of the last things he said was in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And he said, to his followers, he said, don't go anywhere. Stay right in Jerusalem. Wait and pray. Wait and pray. Because you're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. So there's so many conclusions and observations we can make about that. First of all, Jesus says... You can't do church without the Spirit. Okay? You can't do church without the Spirit. So, if the Spirit's not there, you wait. Don't do anything. You just wait and pray until he shows up. Okay? So that's one thing. And he said it's the Spirit who's going to give you power. To do what? Be my witnesses. 
You're, you're supposed to spread this thing. You're supposed to share this thing. You're supposed to reach out into your community, into your culture. You're not supposed to insulate yourself from your culture. You're supposed to infiltrate your culture, integrate with your culture. You're supposed to make a difference. That's what words like salt and light imp apply, imply. Salt, uh, salt does what? It retards decay. It goes out and it permeates that which would naturally decay and it helps to retard that. Now we know it more as a flavoring, but in first century they knew it more as a preservative. Okay, so we're supposed to have that influence in the world. So, and Jesus said you're going to be my witnesses first in Jerusalem. Guess where they were when Jesus said this? Jerusalem. <laughs> The surrounding area was Judea and Samaria, okay? Judea, Samaria to the north, Judea to the south. And then uttermost parts of the world. So it's as if Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to get dropped, like a pebble gets dropped into a pond, into your community. And then you're going to be witnesses unto me first right at home, right where you are. And then that circle is going to expand, Judea and Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. So what we want to do, our destination is that we want to make a difference here, building into one another, here very locally, then in our surrounding community, then even broader down Wilkins Avenue, things like that, wherever the radio waves go, and then the uttermost parts of the world. When we think of the, the Thousand Compassion International children that we support, as a church body, and we'll have, we'll have a speaker from Compassion with us this Sunday. You'll get to learn more about that, or ministries that we have in Kenya, or in Haiti, or in Mexico, that Dave brings his high school teams down to Mexico. We'll be able to hear about the uttermost parts of the world, but that's, that's the outer banks of the emerging circles that are going out. So there's a little bit of Acts 1-8. <clears throat> to reach our community, our culture, and our world for Jesus Christ. Just a little different wording than what Jesus used. Okay, so that's where we're going. That's Bridgeway's vision. We've got a lot of programs that are going to help to get us there, but we want to make sure that we have shared values. What do we value as a church? So these, these values make up the word bridges. Can you see that? Building, reconciliation, instruction, make up the words bridges. So I want to talk to you about these values, why they're important to us as a church, and that's largely because not only our DNA as a church that we're unique, but because of what the, what the Bible teaches. Okay, let's talk about building into one another, the first half of that mission. And this is the passage that I quoted earlier in Matthew 22 about Jesus saying, love the Lord your God, being the greatest commandment. Building into one another is a value that we have. There are two passages in the scripture that we call great passages. The word great doesn't, doesn't well Jesus used the word great here, the greatest command. Uh, and then we call the great commission passage. So let me, let me make this statement, see if you agree with it. God will use a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission to grow a great church. Think about that just a little bit. If you take the two great passages, great command, love God, love others, great commission, go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything I've taught you. If you, if you focus on those two things, if you have a great commitment to those two things, God will use that to grow a great church. Do you agree with that? When, you, when, you think, when churches actually think about what's our purpose, they generally conclude around f four or five different purposes that are going to grow out of the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. So these are two central passages that we really lean into as a church. So building into one another, we lean into the Great Commandment of loving one another and the practice of all those one another's that we've talked about. So how's this accomplished at Bridgeway? Well, anytime people get together, it's accomplished because that's when we're building into one another. So through our care ministry, through counseling ministry, through men's, women's, singles, marriage, life groups, and so many different ways we're build, seeking to build into one another. Second one is reconciliation. So if we're gonna make bridges, right, as core values, we need an R. I think there's a better word than reconciliation for this. 
Uh, because when you think of reconciliation, you may think of reconciliation between God and man, right? Which is what you might think of evangelism. But that's a different core value that we have. When this reconciliation, we're really talking about breaking down walls that tend to divide people groups. So this might be better thought of as bridge building. Building bridges with other people. So reconciliation certainly is being Christ's ambassadors, reconciling God to man. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. But also it's thinking about living in unity when you're a part of different people groups. So bridge building. This is a big core value here at, at Bridgeway. And it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I've learned so much just doing life deeply with people of other cultures. It's really been a great help to me. And it's such a part of our DNA, and we're so comfortable with it that we can even talk about it. Um, you know, I showed up at my men's fraternity Bible study after the two no indictments and just threw out the question to my African-American brothers, and I said, how are you guys feeling? I said, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I'm feeling other than I want to know how you're doing. You know, does this provoke fear in you? Are you afraid for your sons? Are you angry? Uh, what, how, are, how, are you, how are you feeling about this? And it led to a great discussion. Now, if I'm sitting with a monocultural group, that doesn't happen. I don't have that type of a learning. So on our men's retreat a couple years ago, we're at Gettysburg and we're going through the museum. And we're going through a period of history between the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil Rights Movement were a hundred years where African Americans were severely oppressed even though they were free. And it really hadn't necessarily clicked with me until I was going through it observing it with a good friend next to me who was African American. And I turned to Steve and I said, how are you feeling right now? He said, I'm kind of mad. I said, well, I was kind of afraid to ask. <laughs> But that led to a great conversation about why someone of his demographic might have an edge to them uh, against a white culture and why it might be a difficulty for him to allow a wall to come down that might logically divide us because he, f he feels he's been under-resourced and underserved, though he is of, of the same intrinsic value. I, I, I got that in a more unique way there. But it had to happen in the context of doing life together and allowing this stuff to bubble up and not being afraid to address it and talk about it. So that's a real core value here at Bridgeway. One of the ways that we do that is in bridge building seminars. Frank Eastham, his name is listed on the bottom here. Frank teaches these seminars. He used to just open them up to anyone who wants to come. Anyone who wants to come. But those were less effective and here's why. Because you got a, a Caucasian sitting next to a person of color and they're trying to get to know one another at the same time that they're trying to get these barriers to break down. And it, and it didn't happen as quickly as you might understand because there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, it just feels weird right from the start. You're with, doing this with people you don't know. So Frank started doing it with groups that were already pre-established. For instance, a serving group. Okay, let's do a bridge building seminar with the choir or let's do it with the lobby crew, or let's do it with the Bridge Kids Ministry. And so now these people who are already in the context of relationship and maybe feel a little bit more comfortable with one another, now they can begin talking about it. And great opportunity for walls to come down. So a great way to start getting into this bridge building scenario is to get involved in a serving group. Now, this, this is a DNA high value here at Bridgeway and it started in our founding pastor's life even when he was back in college. He roomed with a Caucasian uh, man by the name of, uh, of Brent and Brent Zerker and Pastor D.A. after they left college continued to write to one another to address issues of faith and issues of race and they've taken those letters and put them in Pastor D.A.'s first book 
called Letters Across the Divide. And this sort of put our pastor a little bit on the map as far as being a bridge builder or someone who was at least willing to engage this conversation. So this was over 20 years ago. And so now, as, as you know, he's come out with other books like Gracism and books like Multicultural Ministry and the Multicultural Ministry Handbook, which the staff wrote. And so this has given Bridgeway an opportunity to sort of be on the forefront of working with other organizations, faith-based and not, churches and businesses, and helping to coach them in this whole concept of doing bridge building. So of course, of course we wanted to retain a value inside as well as to be able to influence and to teach and to help and assist other organizations doing it outside of the walls. So bridge building or this idea of reconciliation is a core value at the church. If you haven't, I hope if you've been here more than a couple of months, you've already picked this up. I hope you've picked it up just from hearing things said or just watching how we, how we do life here. Instruction is the next core value. We believe that the Word of God is suitable to direct our lives. We believe it's a very special book, a unique book. It's a book that's living. It's a book that can cut to the core of your being and make differences. It can diagnose you. Uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes talked about it being like goads and nails. Well, goads were like these, think of a cattle prod that excites a, a cow to duty. Uh, the, uh, think of a, a, like a long metal bar in a hard Palestine ground. If you're going to put a tent up, you can't drive a wooden tent stake into hard ground. So what you do is you take the goad and you make the hole. So you create the void first. And then after the void is created, then the stake can come and secure the tent into the ground. Think of how the Word of God does that in our own lives. First, it can create that void. It hurts sometimes, right? It creates that cavity, but then the Word of God can then come and offer assurance and comfort. So Ecclesiastes 12, Solomon's talking about the wise preacher, and he says his words were like goads and nails, and they come from one shepherd. So they come from the Word of God. So we believe the Word of God is very significant. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we believe that the Word of God is a unique book. Paul would say in Romans 12, 1 and 2, By the mercies of God, present yourselves as living sacrifices. It's your reasonable service of worship. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world anymore, but be ye, what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you've got to change your mind. Have you ever read the word of God and realized, I don't think that way. I need to start thinking that way. That's called renewing your mind. It's getting your mind to start thinking God's way instead of, instead of thinking a natural way. And that's a slow process. God uses the word transformation to talk about this process. I'm going to say the word in Greek, not to impress you, but because you're going to hear an English word in that. The word is metamorpho. What word do you hear? Metamorphosis, right? That's when a caterpillar goes inside of a chrysalis and emerges as a butterfly. That's a total transformation. It's going from one thing into another, and it's a time-consuming process. So that's the word that Paul is using here in Romans 12, 1 and 2 to talk about how we're changed through the renewing of our mind. So when we renew our mind through the renewing word of God, we begin to transform from a caterpillar to a butterfly from something that lives on the ground to something that soars above the ground. So that's the transformation that we're talking about. Only happens through the Word of God. So it's a big core value of ours that we teach the Word of God, that we encourage you to be in the Word of God. How's this done? Sunday mornings, we should open our Bibles on a Sunday morning when we're in church. Wednesday night study, shape seminars, all kinds of seminars. Our Pastor Dan teaches like back to the Bible, Wednesday night electives, men's Bible study that I teach in this room on Thursday mornings. Lots of opportunities to work, read and learn and study the Word of God. Next core value, dynamic worship. Who wouldn't agree? 
that our worship is dynamic. And it's a core value at the church. God has sent us so many gifted musicians uh, to minister here. Who's, who's this funny looking fellow right here? I can't, I can't. Is that your husband there? So one of the core values of Bridgeway is dynamic worship. And by dynamic worship, as Nikki wrote out this vision, this core value, it means the following. One, Christ-centered. Okay, so we're singing about Christ. We're keeping him at the, as the focus and the center of our worship, for he is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Culturally diverse. We'll sing sometimes in different languages and different types of music styles in order to show appreciation and different types of instrumentation in order to appreciate different cultures. So culturally diverse. Relationally engaging. If you come to Bridgeway and it feels like a performance, then we've missed the mark. It shouldn't feel like a performance. In other words, you should feel like you're being asked to participate, that you're being engaged with your mind, with your voice, with your spirit. Relationally engaging and skillfully executed. This is why I'm not in the choir, okay? <laughs> this is why I'm here teaching, because there are, we, we each have different gifts that we bring to the table, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, just as a clarification, um, Nikki wants me to make sure that I share with you. Skillfully executed largely, largely means the people who are holding microphones or playing instruments, okay? If you have a, a, a desire and a passion for singing, then the choir certainly is not, and, and you, you wonder about your skill level, the choir may be the place for you. Nikki has even told me she would let me sing in the choir, okay? And so that, the skillfully executed is, is more as it relates to the giftedness. I mean, you have to be able to play, right? Or sing. And some of the rationale for this, and you'll notice this as a pattern in the Old Testament. Um, those who were most skillful were the ones that were able to lead worship in the temple. And the reason for that is we don't want the execution of the music to be a distraction from the worship, right? If the, if, the, if the messenger gets in the way of the message, then you've really inhibited the ability to worship. I mean, it should almost be that whatever's going on on stage almost disappears, right? And that you're ushered into the presence of God. And that's, that's the skill that our, our worship leaders have, to invite you into the presence of the Lord and to worship him there. So that's what's meant by dynamic worship. The next core value is growth. And largely, this is referring to growing as groups. Now, remember I shared with you that the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2. 3,000 people got baptized in verse 41. Okay? So, right after that, we get to see how they were doing church. So, the church goes, church is born. It's got 120 followers. Now, it's 3,120 and we, we had another 5,000 very shortly as well. So what were they doing right away? Well, a great way to think about that is to look in the later 40s of Acts chapter 2. And what they're doing is they're meeting in the temple daily. Okay, so they're, they're doing big group every day. They're getting together in big group. But also they're meeting in homes and they're breaking bread they're having meals together. They're having fellowship. They're hanging out together. They're praying together. And they're listening to the apostles teaching together. So there's, there's a sense in which the church very early on was having the large meeting regularly, but also doing the small groups as well. We believe that you can impress people from afar but you can only impact them from up close. And so you want to get close with people if you really want to leave a legacy and influence others for good. You can't do that unless you're doing life deeply with one another. So some of the ways that we encourage that here is with life groups. We have over 40 active life groups. We just launched 13 of them last Sunday. Malcolm Branner is on the city, very active, can help you to find a life group. We encourage you to be doing life deeply with a smaller group of people. It's great to get together, a thousand of us together, and to worship the Lord. 
But you know what? When I'm struggling with my temper during the week or I've lost my job, I'm, who am I going to call? I'm not going to call the person in row three, seat four, if I don't know their name and we don't have a relationship. So how do I develop that relationship? Well, I got to connect in a small group context. So you can do that in a serving group by getting plugged into a ministry. You can do that in a life group. You can do that in women's ministry. There's now 35 different small groups at the women's ministry meetings on Saturday mornings where you have a table facilitator and we'll, you'll be talking about stuff. Great way to develop relationships. So that passage there, I'll read it to you in Acts chapter 2, 46 and 47. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. The verses right before that talk about those four things they were doing in homes, which was fellowship, prayer, teaching, and the breaking of bread. So those were kind of the four pillars of what they were doing when they were in the homes. So we believe that the, Dave said it already, I'll say it again, the church has to get bigger and smaller at the same time. So yes, we have to be salt and light, a witness to the world, invite people to embrace Christ and be a part of the forever family of God, but also we need to provide opportunities for people to get together in small group contexts. So the next core value is evangelism. So this is where we talk about that other great passage, the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Okay, this is a fun part that people like to play. When we look at the Great Commission, there's four verbs, okay? However, in the Greek language, you can only have one primary imperative verb in a sentence. So you're going to help me figure out which of the four verbs is the imperative. In other words, what are we really being asked to do in the Great Commission? Okay? So let me set this up a little bit. Okay? I already heard one suggestion of one of the verbs. Okay. So if we're keeping tally, give one to the go. Okay? All right. So let me set this up a little bit. In Matthew 28, then Jesus came to them, that being the disciples, and said, now when did he come to them? He came to them in Matthew 28. So, what has already happened? This is the last chapter in Matthew, by the way. So what's already happened? He died, rose from the dead. This is between his resurrection and his ascension. Okay? Jesus is a pretty big deal now. Okay? He's come back from the dead. Okay? Fairly significant historical event. Okay? This gives him some level of credibility. And he speaks to that credibility right now. When he says... All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, I kind of want to know what he has to say after the therefore, don't you? I mean, listen to this setup. Therefore, do what? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Okay, now, from the therefore... The commanded you. There's four verbs. Can you help me name them? What's the first one? Go. Go. Second. Baptizing. I heard baptizing. I'll, I'll, I'll let that be number two. What's number three? This, this is really one word. It's really one word. Okay? Make disciples. Okay? And then the fourth one? Teaching, Teaching them. Good. So you got the four verbs. Okay. So, which is, the, which is the main verb? Which is the imperative? Which is the command? How many say it's go? How many say it's make disciples? How many say it's baptizing? How many say it's teaching? Okay, the most votes on go. So let's go with that, okay? Actually, no. Actually, the go has the least emphasis of the four. It actually could be interpreted as you go. The assumption is we're going all the time. So as you go, be about this. In other words, 
more than the, every, the, more than the great commission, this is the everyday commission. It's as you go. Okay? So sorry about that. <laughs> so of the other three, so now we've got three. So let me just tell you, okay? It's going to surprise some of you. 